M theory. Hisham? Great. Thank you so much, Meng, for the setting this up for the invitation. This is really lovely. Um, so I'm going to talk about geometric topological perspectives in, on M brains, but not restricted to M brains, really. It's going to be more M theory and string theory, uh, but to a large extent, M brains as well. Um, so um, here's the outline. Um, can have a global overview. It's been a while since we had regular, hopefully it's going to become a regular meeting um, on the topological and geometric aspects of string theory and M theory. So there's a lot to, to say. So I want to have more like a schematic um, survey of a lot of things that have been happening in this area. Um, so I want to talk about M brains from world volume perspective and then M brains and M theory from space-time perspective, and then some mathematics associated with that, uh, mainly within rational homotopy theory, and also new connections and applications. So like I said, this survey is a lot of works that I did with uh, mainly Urs Schreiber, Domenico Fiorenza, um, my postdoc Dan Grady on differential cohomology, and earlier work with Igor Krizh and Matai, who is here, and more recent Works also include John Huerta and Vincent Brownack-Meyer. Um, so uh, I want to start with a global overview. So, let's see. Um, so it's going to be schematic, like I said. So I want to start with asking questions about what math uh, extracting uh, something out of the interaction between math and physics. So one can get math from physics in the sense of trying to get new mathematical structures and constructions that one can get from studying M theory, for example, or one can get math in physics in the sense of what mathematical structures, conditions, tools should we have in place in order to properly describe uh, M theory and hence string theory and so on, uh, and maybe quantum field theory even. Now, of course, there are advantages and disadvantages to looking at this. The advantages are that um, by phrasing things mathematically, the physics become becomes more transparent. The disadvantage is that um, we will be dealing with mathematically idealized physical models. So not going to be the precise models that one wants to get. And of course, uh, Christian already alluded to that repeatedly. Um, all right, so um, M theory connects to a lot of um, concepts in mathematics. Um, and part of the theme of this conference is to highlight some of these concepts. Um, so it connects to supergeometry, to higher geometry, as Christian explained to us. Differential cohomology as well. I'm going to highlight some aspects of this, as well as generalized cohomology. And towards the end, I'm going to um, connect to parametrized homotopy theory, as well as equivariant homotopy theory, from a rational uh, point of view first, and then integrally as well. Um, so this is the... Um, big arching uh, theme here. So, <clears throat> so looking at physical theories and trying to extract some geometry out of them, um, of course, we've seen that in M theory in 11 dimensions, the objects are, the main objects of interest are the M brains, the M2 brain, the M5 brain. And of course, reduction to various string theories in 10 dimensions will result in strings in D brains. And what do we require? So sort of like a mini wish list um, uh, so we want consistent formulation, we want no anomalies, we want things hopefully to be mathematically rigorous, and we want it to contain as much information about the system as possible. It might not be exactly their system, but hopefully I'll get an approximation to that. Uh, schematically, um, if we have uh, Dirac theory of spinners, uh, this is going towards higher structures, but more from a, a homotopy theory point of view. Then, of course, we need spin structure, and we have a corresponding group, the spin group. If we want to describe string theory, of course, um, um, Christian also mentioned that. Uh, then we need a string structure, and then we have a corresponding group, the string group. And it turns out, to some extent, if we want to describe the five brain theory, um, and again, all this is mathematically idealized, then we want a five brain structure, and then there's a corresponding group in the homotopy sense called the five brain group. Um, so structures associated with these gadgets, from a topology point of view, we want to extract the field strengths, um, which correspond to anomalies or constraint on these field strengths. And then from a differential geometric point of view, we want to highlight potentials and corresponding Wilson loops 
are holonomies. So uh, corresponding to each uh, kind of a, a brain, we have a topological uh, geometric um, entity, just to set the notation. So for the particle, we have a, a usual field strength, sort of like the yang mills, and the corresponding potential is A1. For the string, we have H3, um, and then it has a corresponding potential given by B2. For the M2 brain, we have G4 with the C field, and then for the M5 brain, well, it depends what you mean by the M5 brain. I could mean the NS5 brain. I could mean the M5 brain in 6D or 7D or 8D as an extended world volume. And you have corresponding entities to that. Um, so the main setting is as follows. So in strength theory, um, we have a sigma model, 10-dimensional sigma model. In M theory, we have, um, we have the M2 brain replacing that. And then we have spinners in the case of strength theory, and we have corresponding spinners in the case of the M2 brain. And you want to interpret the B2 um, as a connection on a one gerb. Similarly, the C3, you want it to interpret it as a two connection on a two gerb. And then the boundary of the string sits on a D brain. The boundary of the M2 brain sits on the M5 brain. If we want to uh, look at this from a, a more topological point of view, we would want to impose anomaly cancellation conditions. Here in string theory, we have the freed witten condition, which is um, W3, the third integral stiefel witten class, plus the class of H, is zero in integral cohomology. And in M3, we have Witten's flux quantization. Uh, G4 plus half lambda is an integral class in 11 dimensions. Lambda is half P1, the first point tracking class, or more appropriately, the first spin characteristic class. Um, which is the generator of degree four of the classifying space of B spin. Um, so one, there has been some, um, a, an approach to try to interpret ob, uh, conditions like this as obstructions from actual obstruction theory in homotopy theory via a T. Hesebrock spectral sequence. So this here would give you a twisted uh, spin C condition because vanishing W3 by itself is a spin C condition, and if it's not zero on the nose, but up to that guy, then we call, um, uh, then that's called the twisted spin C. And uh, um, here on this side, um, this can be viewed as a twisted string structure because the vanishing of lambda by itself is uh, correspond to a string structure, but if it's not vanishing, but you can combine A and G4 and say, lambda is zero up to those, so then those act as a twist. And here the corresponding cohomology theory, uh, which has this kind of an orientation, is twisted K theory. And um, here the corresponding uh, cohomology theory that should have this orientation is twisted elliptic cohomology. You're not demanding that the class yeah. A vanish, are you? Sorry? You're not demanding that the class A vanish. Yeah, that's right. But you see, you can set this in such a way that G4 plus A is another class, let's say. And if lambda is divisible by 2, then this is fine. Then the combination of G4 and A, and can view it as a twist. Oh, right? Yeah. Combine them together yeah, into another entity. Um, and there, yeah, there are a lot of homotopic constructions here um, uh, building on, on this um, that I'm not going to be able to um, discuss in a lot of detail here. I might mention it a, few, a couple more times. But here we want to uh, take a step back and look at things rationally and um, supply the geometry and see other angles as well. Um, so this is what we're going to do. We're going to highlight M theory and then highlight um, uh, homotopy theory and generalized cohomology. So, okay, I want to say also uh, some things about what, what we need in order to properly de describe physical systems in this context, let's say. So I want to talk about, um, well, fields want to be in cohomology generally, uh, but there's uh, a reason why I want to twist this cohomology theory or generalize it, make it into a generalized cohomology theory, or um, differentially refining it by including the, the geometry. Um, so, this is how one would think about modeling fields, let's say. This is not what one does, literally. 
but this is my way of seeing how things evolve, say, if you're looking at a classical system, you're presented with differential forms, let's say at the level of supergravity, and then you try to extract, extract gauge invariant quantities, and then you look at the Ramka homology, and then you form some sort of a quantization. You start going more towards um, integral cohomology, and then you include anomaly cancellations, you get generalized cohomology. It's sort of like this, this is schematic. Um, so the upshot of this is that the partition functions, which are sums uh, or integrals of modelized spaces of fields, should take values in this cohomology theory, let's say. Um, and want to introduce twists, as we said, so I'd like to introduce automorphisms, and these um, arise from geometric and physical considerations. Um, so the homotopy uh, point of view on this is that one looks at a family setting, bundles of spectra setting. Um, um, so this picture that I had written down vertically, now I'm writing it horizontally. So there's a corresponding twist for each one of these levels of understanding. So for DRAM forms, one can twist DRAM forms, one can twist DRAM cohomology, one can twist integral cohomology, and um, any generalized cohomology from an um, um, abstract point of view. Now, of course, constructing the twist is another story. And um, the simplest example of a twist, twisting of forms given by the orientation bundle. And the next um, example, twisting Dirac cohomology, one starts with the Dirac complex, and one can twist by a one form that's, say, built out of scalar functions, and this shows up in Witten's deformation of Morse theory. Um, so uh, with a, coming up with a, with a smooth function, forming a, a differential like that, one can show that, well, it's obvious, that d squared is zero. Um, so <clears throat> one can have, in, in this case, because this is exact, there's a, a quasi-isomorphism, meaning this would lead to the same cohomology between uh, a complex built out of d and a complex built out of ds, and then we call this exponential factor a quasi-isomorphism, so they have the same cohomology group. Now one can twist by a closed three form, and this is the more familiar way of twisting. And um, twisted Dirac cohomology then uh, is defined as the kernel modulo the image of this twisted differential. So the main example here is Ramoramo fields in string theory, as shown by um, Menasium, Moore, Witten, um, and others. Um, so um, can, one, can one form higher twists? We looked at one twist, three twist. Can one form higher twists? Um, uh, then yeah, sure, one can do it. And, um, one can form a differential with the sum of any odd uh, closed um, differential forms. And one can form corresponding graded Dirac complexes with such differentials. And this actually, um, um, has applications because in, if you look at heterotic string theory and you try to mimic what happened here in, in the case of ramon Ramon fields here, one combines the ramon Ramon fields of every degree to form a total RR field. So if you try to do the same in heterotic string where F is a billionized Yang Mills field and star F is its dual and try to form a total um, field strength like that, and if you look at variation of the action together with the chaplain manton coupling gives you this equation, um, d minus h7 on f is zero, uh, where dh7 is um, where this combination forms a differential squares to zero for the same reason that these guys did. So this does have uh, applications in, in string theory. Um, so one, because of this uh, point of view, this point of view here, that one starts here, try to build their uh, one's way up that way. So is that a mechanism of lifting? It's not really a mathematically well-defined question. Um, so <clears throat> main example here is via churn character, and the churn character appears most prominently in twisted K theory. Uh, so there's a twisted churn character that takes you from twisted K theory, twisted DRAM cohomology. And similarly, for any twisted cohomology theory, it doesn't have to be twisted. Any cohomology theory, you have a churn character. And then you can ask, well, um, 
um, can, you, can you find this guy, can you find this generalized cohomology given twisted cohomology? Because you really start from here. You're not given that. You start here and you supply some anomaly conditions and other ingredients in order for you to arrive there. Similarly here for any cohomology theory. So it's a, sort of like a reverse engineering kind of a problem. Um, so the second uh, ingredient was uh, twist. The third ingredient is differential refinement. So one wants to supply the geometry into the problem. So one introduces geometric data uh, through differential forms, either connections or churn forms, um, uh, in order to retain differential form representatives of cohomology classes. So, <clears throat> so starting with dynamic cohomology or integral cohomology or generalized cohomology, one adjoins differential forms to each one of them so that this leads to differential refinements to each one of these flavors. And um, this, um, the, the underlying um, geometry and topology needed for this is supplied by Hopkins, Sanger, Bonke, um, Ors, and others. And um, it's, a, it's a fiber product. It's a, um, it's a, fiber, a twisted or fiber product um, of forms with generalized cohomology where they match when they meet in DRAM cohomology. It's a homotopy pullback diagram. So that differential cohomology is really this kind of a um, homotopy fiber product. Um, so example, uh, differential refinement integral cohomology, it has um, uh, several incarnations, either algebraic, it leads to Deline cohomology, or um, geometric approach, differential characters or gerbs, or there's an axiomatic approach using that homotopy pullback that we saw before. And if we concentrate on the Deline cohomology uh, part, it arises through looking at um, truncated DRAM complexes up to degree n, let's say, and replacing the, um, um, the sheaf, uh, the structure sheaf with a multiplicative group uh, using the exponential map to get a modified DRAM, uh, truncated DRAM complex. And Deline cohomology in degree n plus one is the hypercohomology of the complex of sheaves of Babinian groups. And uh, one can write down uh, um, this, this diagram here as a part of a diamond, if you um, rotate by 45 degrees and you look at closed n plus one forms and n plus one integral cohomology classes that meet in DRAM cohomology through DRAM's theorem and the churn character. And this is gonna be um, this incarnation of integral differential cohomology. Um, one can do the same for a generalized cohomology. Given any generalized cohomology, you can actually differentially refine it. Uh, the main thing you need, you need some information about that theory um, in differential forms, and that's supplied by looking at forms with coefficients, that coefficients of the theory, meaning the value of the theory at a point. You look at the value of the theory at the point. That really essentially characterizes the theory. And if you look at forms with values in that, it means you're just tensoring with these coefficients. You look at your forms, you tensor with the coefficients. And one can look at closed valued forms in this context, and then also DRAM uh, cohomology valued, um, valued in the coefficients as well. And then a smooth extension is going to be a con contravariant functor, being cohomology theory, between compact smooth manifolds as opposed to topological spaces or CW complexes because we're in the differential setting, uh, integrated abelian groups. And again, this is yet a, a third way of writing that diagram down. This is a differential cohomology theory, and it's a pullback of, four, of valued forms as well as the underlying topological cohomology theory such that they agree in valued DRAM cohomology. And of course, a lot of um, researchers have uh, made this very uh, precise. Um, so the full structure one wants, you want uh, twisted, differential, and generalized uh, cohomology at once. You want to have the geometric data given by forms. You want the topological data given by the underlying cohomology theories. You want to twist each one of these, and then we differentially refine. When you differentially refine, um, 
Twisting up here is by a cohomology class in the topological setting. When you do differential refinement, um, what ends up twisting these differential theories are the corresponding geometric objects corresponding to the underlying topological twist. So for example, in the case of K theory, this H hat is gonna be a gerb with connections. So then one can twist not just with a closed um, odd form, but a gerb with connection. Similarly for other theories as well. So examples one can do um, things that show up um, motivated from physics from another point of view, canceling anomalies in space-time, twisted Morava K-theory and E-theory, generalizations of K-theory and twisted TMF, topological modular forms, also motivated from anomaly cancellations in um, M-theory. One can also set this up in such a way that uh, one can talk about higher gerbs. Um, so if you're looking at generalizations of um, the system where you have a, a gerb, then you can say, well, what's the Grotendieck group that corresponds to um, n gerbs or um, n, plus two bu n plus one bundles? And one can form iterated K theory that corresponds to that and even twist it. Um, and one can do differential refinements of all these uh, cohomology theories that show up. So depending on the system that you have, you're going to have your favorite cohomology theory that comes into play. Um, so an, a direct application of this is that, remember we said we want to uh, identify physical conditions as obstructions um, and uh, particularly as differentials in the T. Herzberg spectral sequence corresponding to some theory. And um, it turns out spectral sequences can be extended to differential refinements. And um, so we, by adjoining geometric data, and <clears throat> this sort of uh, like a meta theorem combines a bunch of theorems. So we have a, a differential refinement of the following. So in a series of papers with uh, Dan Grady, we uh, refined uh, primary cohomology operations, including Steenrod squares, to the differential setting, secondary cohomology operations, including Massey products, and um, we um, built the T. Herzberg spectral sequence and concretely identified the differentials. Of course, here, you no longer have just differentials that are purely topological. You have differentials that mix topological data with geometric data as well, and these are novel that you wouldn't see just by looking at the topological theory. So here's how it works. You start with the untwisted theory E. You can do two things to it, either twist it or differentially refine it, um, and then do the other operation. You arrive at twisted differential um, theory, and then you start with a, a differential, let's say given by a standard square, for example, and then when you twist, what happens is that the twisted differential picks up a secondary operation. This was shown by Atiyah and Siegel, and then if you differentially refine, then you get a refined differential. This is shown by us with Dan. Um, so you get um, a differential refinement. So any time we have a hat means differential refinement. For example, SQ hat in this case. And then if you twist, then you get two things. You get differential refinement of the differential uh, as a primary operation, and then differential refinement of the secondary operation given, say, by Massey product. And this generalizes um, a T.S. Siegel to the um, twisted differential case. Okay, so that was the first part. Um, the, now I want to move on to the world volume theories. And of course, the disclaimer is that I'm not really doing two comma zero, one comma zero. Same one already. Christian already uh, highlighted that. So um, I'm going to talk about higher structures that were also mentioned. Um, so the, the, these fields um, require some higher tangential structures. So instead of looking at um, uh, just tangent bundle structure, one has to look at some connected cover. This uh, notation means that you've killed uh, homotopy groups of BSL up to dimension up to degree n now. And so, for example, spin structure is obtained by killing um, the fundamental group of SL. Because it beats the height, there's a shift uh, in the in the homotopy groups, and um, the obstruction 
So the way we read this is that you have a map to BSL and you want to lift it to a map to B spin, and then the obstruction is given by this class, which in this case is W2. Of course, we know from elsewhere that the obstruction to having a spin structure is given by the second Stiefel Whitney class. Um, so for n equals four, one gets a string structure. So given a, a spin structure, you want to lift it to a string structure. So you need to um, impose the vanishing of that class, half P1 that we mentioned earlier. One can actually entertain other possibilities as well, five brain, nine brain, and so on, and even things in between corresponding to generalization of orientation and spin structure. And this was motivated by the green schwarz anomaly and its uh, dual with um, Ors and Jim. Um, so at the infinitesimal level, so these are supposed to be, um, well, globally, they're supposed to be uh, groups in the homotopy sense. Uh, the infinitesimal levels, they're truncations of L infinity algebras. So string is a Lie uh, um, two algebra, five brains a six algebra. Nine brains a 10 algebra it means it has brackets of higher degrees up to uh, that degree plus one. And um, one can build characteristic classes corresponding to these and uh, work out a lot of um, concepts here. So there are variations on these constructions. So uh, given the physics situation, one wants these to be twisted. I already mentioned the, um, the uh, Witten flux quantization as a twisting of a string structure. Uh, one can supply a lot of geometry in way of higher uh, bundles, um, looking at a stacky perspective. Um, but we know also from physics, um, the situation is not always Riemannian. Sometimes you want to do pseudo Riemannian. And uh, indeed, with one of my PhD students, Shem, we extended it to the Lorenzian case, instead of starting from spin n, start from spin pq and use the same kind of lifting. And uh, with Matt, who is here, he's going to talk more about this, uh, we looked at characterizations of these at the level of rational cohomology. Um, so um, I want to motivate stacks a little bit. So one way of looking at higher bundles, especially if you want to supply the geometry, including um, gauge transformations and gauge of gauge transformations. And again, Christian um, mentioned the need to do, to do those, and he mentioned an approach. Uh, this is a, a little more algebraic. Um, so if, if we have a Lie group, one can look at a classifying space, BG, which is a topological space. Or what you care about is the homotopy type of BG. And then homotopy classes of maps from X to BG um, are equivalence classes of G principal bundles on X. Now, of course, there are um, some things that this doesn't uh, know about. For example, the smooth gauge transformations and the actual gauge fields. And we want to supply these. In order to do so, there's a smooth groupoid or smooth uh, stack such that, well, you want to replace this BG um, that we're mapping to by some other space that sees the geometry when we map to it. So maps of smooth stacks, and of course, any space, you can view it as a stack in a trivial way, corresponds to G bundles on, on X, such that homotopies and higher homotopies and so on correspond to gauge transformations and gauge of gauge transformations and so on. And um, <clears throat> to, to address both at the same time, one looks at differential refinement to a richer smooth stack, BG con connection, such that maps to that space um, correspond to actual G Mills fields on X. So the true configuration space is going to be this smooth mapping stack. And um, I want to mention an approach to higher uh, um, abelian bundles, which is related to this approach to, um, to Delinka homology that I mentioned here. So, a very systematic way of looking at these stacks is starting with some complex and then applying some process to it to get uh, these stacks. So that's the most transparent way of talking about these things. So I want to start with sheaves of chain complexes. So look at chain complexes. So really the idea you want to try to 
form a bundle of chain complexes, something like that. But you do it locally in, in such a way that you can glue. And if you're able to glue, you get a sheaf. And there's something called dulled con correspondence. And stackification, it gives you this stack. So the idea is, is not bad, actually. You, not bad to understand, I meant. So the, the um, n stack of u1 n bundles without connections is obtained by applying this process. I'm not going to explain what it is in details. But you apply it to this uh, chain complex. You just have u1 and then zeros in every other degree. And then um, if you want to have um, abelian n bundles with connections, so you need to have more data and weigh differential forms. And indeed, you just form the Deline complex. It starts out being like that. And then you supply forms up to that degree. And then uh, equivalence classes of, of these are um, in natural bijection with any of these groups. You can look at it from a, a sheaf point of view, hypercohomology point of view, or stacky point of view. Similarly, for the case when you have connections, you have various um, applications. So the word stacks looks scary, but it's not really that bad if you look at it from this point of view. Um, so once you have a stack that has a lot of geometry, there's a process in which you can um, do reverse differential refinement, if you like. You can strip the geometric data out of your system by using um, a geometric realization. And uh, um, if, if you have cohomology, then cohomology is represented by homotopy classes of maps to eilenberg maclean space. And in order to get a differential analog of cohomology, you need a differential analog of eilenberg maclean space, which is an N stack, BNU1, in such a way that the geometric realization of that stack coincides with the underlying homotopy type of KZM plus 1. And one can do this not just for abelian things, but for non-abelian spaces like B spin. And one can get a classifying stack for non-abelian groups like spin, um, spin n and greater than 1, um, or, yeah, 2, uh, then uh, such that the uh, geometric realization gives you the underlying homotopy type. Um, OK, so now I want to start looking at um, these idealized ways of looking at M brains, I want to extract a string class from the M2 brain. It's actually going to be um, straightforward. Of course, one set up, can set up the partition function using the fields. And it turns out that the partition function, there are two contributions, one from the C field, one from the fermions. And separately, they're not well defined, but the product is. And um, the way we can set this up is that you look at boundaries and you try to understand these anomalies by looking at the co-boundary, I should say, for a four-manifold uh, whose boundary is the um, two-brain world volume. And, um, uh, and what we want to say is that um, in the usual case, one assumes that the, uh, the membrane world volume has a spin structure. But we want to say that it also has a string structure basically by virtue of dimension. So because it's dimension three, then it has a spin, uh, string structure because the obstruction is of degree four. So it's not going to be consequential. And so what's the point of this? So you can do it. Um, but the point is that you can have more than one string structure. And if you're trying to calculate the partition function, you want to sum over string structures, like you try to calculate the partition function in string theory by summing over spin structures, let's say. Um, um, so one can, one can describe this using diagrams. Um, but the idea here is that the set of uh, string structures is going to be a torsor for H3. Um, this is actually a general effect. The space of any structure with, of this type in dimension n is going to be a torsor for the cohomology group in one degree less. With uh, integral coefficients. It works that way. Uh, but then if, we, if we're looking at H3 of M3, then it's sort of like the volume. So now the, the space of such string structures, you can view it as a multiple of the volume or um, <clears throat> uh, parameterized by the volume. So that's a very concrete thing. Um, yeah, so one can make that uh, precise um, by using um, very simple uh, sequences in cohomology, 
And the idea is that given a choice of initial structure, any other choice would be given by difference with multiples of the volume form. And um, the only parameter that's varying is that multiple of the volume form. And one can see further effects here. For example, uh, by the index theorem, one can look at, uh, at pairings uh, between that relative cohomology class and the relative fundamental class. And one can find that it's well-defined mod 24. And uh, this 24 can be described um, using cobordism of string manifolds because um, the cobordism group of string manifolds in dimension three for string structures is Z mod 24. Um, I wrote it funnily here using the homotopy, um, the algebraic topology notation. So I'm using the more common geometry notation. And um, when both, so you had a choice here starting from M3 having a string structure. Do you want the bounding manifold to have a string structure or a spin structure? If both have string structure, then the pairing is well-defined mod uh, 24. So changing, uh, we mentioned this, changing the string structure amounts to changing its volume. And uh, the option of this is that the membrane partition function, which one can try to work out, and we have, depends on the choice string structure on the well volume. So there are further connections to this to uh, when we mentioned string cobordism, but also topological modern forms and um, suggestions uh, that I made that charges of membranes um, uh, take values in TMF, and then um, building this in an anomaly-free way requires a real version of uh, Morava E theory called EO2 theory. Um, okay, so now I want to start looking at um, the C field and its dual from a uh, stacky perspective. So locally, what are we given in supergravity? So we are given a three form, a three form um, which is a C field and SO valued one form, the Fairbine. And if we have a boundary, let's say the heterotic theory, for example, we're going to have E8 valued uh, one forms, gauge fields, and a B field. Uh, now globally, um, we want these to be um, to arrange themselves in such a way that we get um, twisted differential co-cycles. So there's an analogy with the um, um, dismier duadi class um, that was um, um, discussed extensively, well, this part, by Matai and Peter and uh, Carey and others. So um, the, the higher degree analog of this that was in the, in the degree three case, in the degree four case, that class A which uh, takes us from B8 to B31. So there's a moduli stack of E8 bundles um, or circle three bundles or two gerbs um, that can, one can build around this. Uh, and under geometric realization, um, this gives us the usual morphism between classifying space of E8 to KZ4, which represents that class A. Um, and so one main point here is that uh, while an abelian E8 gauge fields have very different differential geometry than abelian three-form connections, the instanton sectors of both uh, may be identified. Um, so now I want to throw in the, the brain. So if we have a five brain well volume embedded into space-time, then one can build a co-cycle in A-twisted um, relative differential cohomology as a, as a commuting diagram of, of higher stacks in the sense that we mentioned earlier in such a, such a way that there's a homotopy between, um, so I should, Q, Q is the brain, sorry. So this, this is a general picture that's a specific case for the five uh, brain world volume. Um, and um, this is, we can view this, and I mentioned this earlier, we can view it as a C-twisted differential um, structures associated with the E8 bundle. Um, and there are um, two connections in the sense that um, Christian also mentioned. Um, so in analogy, where the abelian B field on D brain gives rise to a non-abelian one form gauge field, the restriction of the C field gives rise to a non-abelian uh, two form gauge field. So that's why one wants to 
ultimately talk about a non-abelian uh, gerb theory associated with it. Okay, so um, one can describe that with them flux quantization using stacks as well, using a homotopy um, pullback diagram. Um, and uh, previously we had half lambda, the lambda itself is half P1. So um, this is multiplying that formula by two. And this is the, the moduli stack of the C field, which has a, a degree four differential cohomology component and a fear bind and an E8 field, uh, differential field component, so that they agree down there. Um, so a field co configuration has a circle three connection, a spin connection, E8 principal bundle, and a choice of gauge transformation. Uh, again, as Christian highlighted, um, one needs to have a, a choice of an isomorphism because everything is up to that. Um, between the circle three bundle and the difference between the Cher Simons three bundle and the spin and E8 bundles. Um, so one can look at boundary uh, moduli as well. If one looks at the C field configurations, there are two types of boundaries. One can look at the heretic boundary, or one can look at the M5 brain as some sort of a boundary. And there are two stages um, to, to looking at this. So one can have a boundary zero and boundary uh, mapping to this um, as a restriction mapping to this big uh, space or stack. And uh, in the case of the M5 brain, what you require is um, that the differential cohomology class vanishes, but a differential three form part remain while restriction to the heretic boundary because of the involution that um, kills a certain parity of the fields, you want the full differential cohomology class to vanish. That is the topology part as well as the differential form part. So in both cases, this, this represents a, a way of um, describing how the E8 bundle, which a priori is a topological theory in the bulk, becomes a, a dynamical theory on the boundary. So this is a... Um, uh, description of that. Okay, so um, I want to continue with looking at the M brains and using non abelian Chern Simons theory. Uh, so if we have a class that's trivial in cohomology, then it signals that we want to look at boundaries. Um, so we just mentioned boundaries. And uh, for the M2 brain, of course, it being three dimensional, we already mentioned from a, a topology point of view. It already has a string structure, and it's trivialized now geometrically because of dimension. And for the five brain, we, we want to look at the dual notion, which is the five brain structure as well. And um, the, the way, the, way the, the combination of the fields arise is that you're going to have uh, compositeness here because of the way the churn, because really the the churn Simons form in, in 11 dimensional supergravity it's composite and that's why what couples the M5 brain is going to be a composite of a seven form and a three form wedged with the uh, first Pontryagin class. So this captures some aspects of, of that theory uh, the 7D churn Simons theory associated with the extension of the M5 braid one volume one dimension higher. Um, so the abelian theory, the way this works, the abelian theory, one looks at the conformal blocks uh, that are identified with geometric quantization of 7D churn simons theory, which arises from dimensional reduction of the, um, um, of the triple, um, of, the, of the, the term that has three G4s, right? Sometimes called Chern-Simons, I'm reluctant to call it that. But okay, let's say the physics lingo, we call it Chern-Simons term. And integrating over um, transverse S4 gives you that um, actual Chern-Simons. Um, actually, this can be described what's called extended higher cup product Chern-Simons theory. And actually we developed this with, with, with um, Domenico and Orr. So I think that's fine. Okay, um, and this induces a cell dual two form on the boundary. 
Now, for the non-abelian um, theory, one needs some source of um, uh, this non-abelian feature, and it comes from this um, sometimes called one-loop uh, correction, which is a, a combination of the Pontryagin classes. And, and now if we, if we um, apply the same process, we're going to get a Chern-Simons form corresponding to this non-abelian part, uh, because this has the gravitational part of, um, of the theory in way of um, Pontryagin classes of the tangent bundle, um, where, yeah, CS is the trivialization of this I8. Um, and one can look at uh, boundaries as well. So what I'm saying here is I'm doing this quickly because already Christian mentioned that we want to try to describe um, the M5 brain theory using string two connections. And that's what I'm saying here, that one can do it in the abelian case and non-abelian case very explicitly, although my presentation here is um, brief. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's right, exactly. So there's an ADS-7 lurking in the background. I mean, X7, if you like. It's a good point. Okay, um, so again, um, this is basically repeating what we said before about boundaries, but the main point here to summarize is that uh, what locally looks like a spin connection globally is a two connection on a twisted string principle to bundle, or equivalently, a twisted differential string structure. I mean, a lot of adjectives, but really, you do want to have the twist because that's what M3 comes with, with a twist, and you want to do differential because you want to include the geometry in order for things to be dynamical, not just purely topological. And you want to have string because that's the Pontryagin class shows up naturally. So this is really um, the natural words to say here. Okay, where well, the twist is given by the, that class to A. And indeed, one can, one can describe this more generally uh, than what applies to M5 brain. We call these cup product churn simons theories. Um, so yeah, one can, one can look at this in, full, uh, uh, in a fully fledged way and look at corresponding uh, spaces of fields corresponding to any configuration you want in this context. Um, so I don't know how I'm doing on, on time. Uh, oh, well, OK. I'm running a bit late, slow. OK. Uh, so now I want to mention some uh, recent work with Matai um, that um, connects to some of these things on, on um, Christian's wish list. And again, this is going to be a mathematically idealized situation. Um, where I'm not really doing any of these standard models, two comma zero, one comma zero, et cetera. But I want to address two, two points here. First, self-duality. Of course, we all know that there's a problem with self-duality of odd forms, right? You can't write down an action. There are ways around it, PST, et cetera, was mentioned in the previous talk. And I want to try to come up with uh, some sort of conformal invariance, right? And maybe modularity. You want to try to come up with modularity um, already in 6D, how about that? Why don't we have modularity in 6D? Why do we have to reduce down to 4D to get modularity in 4D using the torus? That's the usual yoga, right? You look at an extra torus and you say the modes around the torus, as Jack was explaining also, right? That gives you modularity down in 4D. Why shouldn't there be... So what does the phrase modularity in 6D mean? It means the partition function is a modular form. Yes. Yes, yeah, so I'm going to explain where that comes from. So one way, of course, that we all know is if you have an extra torus. Now, um, what Matayan did, and I did, is uh, to say that the source of modularity is coming from non-commutativity, from non-commutative geometry. Okay. So let me explain. Um, I mean, again, this is mathematically idealized situation. It's not going to be the exact physics answer. 
But um, let's entertain this. I mean, these are two main ingredients in, in, on the list. So, I mean, of course we know and, um, that this has uh, consequences for geometric language, and maybe there is something in, in 6D for... Um, yeah, I'll talk about it tomorrow. So yeah. you, you can see that this, uh, there's this uh, SL2D symmetry coming from the EPS spectrum of the 2,0 theory on a flat 6 kind of with no torus inside. So there is a symmetry that's intrinsic Okay, excellent. So although here we do have a, a torus lurking in the background because we're going to have an isometry group acting on the six manifold and then within that isometry group, of course, there's going to be maximal torus. So there is a torus if you like, but we're not going to be uh, doing the usual thing of kaluza klein reduction um, like in F-theory, for example. Okay, um, so well, I mean, okay, maybe I should skip this. Probably all know this because I wasn't sure what the audience is going to be like. Um, but we know be, if we have a B field, then the underlying space is going to be non-commutative, whether it's space time or um, a brain, right? And uh, an M theory phi brain has a B field on it, so why not take that seriously? There's a B field non phi brain, right? And it becomes non-commutative. And um, in a special case, when one reduces to 4D, that was described by Nekrasov and Schwartz, but want to consider six-dimensional uh, theory. And um, yeah, there's a paper by uh, David and collaborators on looking at non-commutative geometry arising from the C field. Um, but we're going to describe things uh, uh, slightly differently um, because of what we have in mind. And this uses the notion of strict deformation quantization of Riefel. And then in the context of T-duality, Matai and Hanabis, uh, developed a parametrized version because that's what you want for T-duality. Um, and so the source of, non of sorry, non-commutativity, not commutativity, the source of non-commutativity here is going to be put in by hand as a new mathematical parameter. Um, so ultimately one hopes that this has a physical meaning. But for, for now, this is a model. Um, so this is the action. Of course, we keep saying there's no action, but we do write actions down. And Christian did write down an action. So, okay. So uh, we assume, okay, action in two senses. Two senses. So first we assume that there's an, an action of a torus um, on, on the world volume. But again, that doesn't have to be as a bundle in the usual sense, but it could be through the isometry group, slightly different. So the, the action functional, I should say, is going to be like this. So we said, well, let's take things um, in the most straightforward way possible. So uh, we want to deform everything inside. So we want to deform the, the six-dimensional manifold in using strict deformation quantization. We want to deform uh, um, the, uh, the wedge product into an uncommutative product. We want to deform the Hodge star operator into an uncommutative. And, um, and this requires um, working with these ingredients to make sense of this action. So that's what we want to set up. And what is this going to do for us? So if one looks at the dynamics, so uh, there's a precedent to this in non-commutative Yang Mills. Um, and similarly, one gets the equations of motion as usual. I mean, you can see the, the obvious uh, changes here. So I'm going to have thetas where appropriate. And this is going to be the main system of equations that one deals with. And uh, th the first aspect that we're looking at is um, that you are able to write expressions like this or like this, either way, um, using self-duality and the fact that H is a three-form, something you would not have been able to write down the commutative um, uh, world. So of course, we know that self-duality of two p plus one forms in four p plus two dimensions is a problem. And this consequently leads to problems on the partition function. And there are ways around this uh, using holomorphic factorization, then extending to 
Chen Simon's theory or to, to disk bundle theory on that theory. And then the partition function is a section of some line bundle intermediate Jacobian. And I think Sam is going to talk about this. Where's Sam? Yeah, Sam is going to talk about it. And um, so one, one can describe this also, this whole story using differential cohomology and stacks. But coming back to what we're doing here, the non-commutative formation does not suffer from this immediate problem. So if we look at the wedge product of two forms of odd degrees, it's not going to vanish immediately. Um, so for um, p equals 1, this corresponds to our setting for the phi brain here. Uh, but then what we're doing here can be extended to other situations. Oops. Done, die. Sorry. OK, I'm hoping it's not going to collapse on me. <laughs> OK, so um, of course, we know other situations uh, where this happens. For example, the cell dual scalar in 2D and type 2B in 10 dimensions. So what we do here can be useful there as well. Um, so uh, for S duality, so what we're going to do, we're going to further modify the system mathematically, artificially by adding coupling constants. But we know, of course, we want to map to the actual physical theory. There are not cop no coupling constants. But let's, let's allow this. And if we do that, then it's going to look sort of like Yang-Mills theory. But now, non-commutative Yang-Mills theory and the coupling parameter is this tau is the, the coupling. Theta is the theta, theta parameter. Um, and the main point here is that um, the deformed wedge product is no longer skew symmetric, so it's possible to restore full uh, SL2Z symmetry um, as a purely non-commutative phenomenon. And so, OK, here, actually, we do evaluate the partition function, um, but I'm not going to go through all of that. Um, um, but the upshot is that, um, as I mentioned earlier, usually modularity arises in 4D by reduction on torus. But that's not what we're doing here. Um, so one can, well, this is what happens in, in general, classically. Um, maybe I should skip this. So, um, so if you look at M6, is an X4 class T2. And look at this ansatz, then you get the, the Maxwell equations as usual. Um, so here, um, using, um, so one can do it in 6D, but you can also dimensionally reduce. So nothing against dimensionally reducing, and that's what I'm uh, in, um, explaining here. So there are notions of non-commutative non conformal structures due to Kahn and Moscovici. And um, um, that equation by um, these equations without theta are conformally invariant, but they because of the way we set things up, they are also conformally invariant in the non-commutative sense as well. And, um, and of course, one can look at that special case that we looked at uh, previously. Um, so the modularity of the partition function, so this is just a, an overview of what happened in the, in the usual case. I think I want to skip that. So basically, we, we look at that action, and um, I think I want to get to the uh, main point here, which is that um, if, you, if you set up the partition function properly, you want to sum over uh, gerbs, so you want to sum over H3, and we're doing uh, isospectral deformations so that the cohomology um, is not like non-commutative cohomology. The cohomology is the same, but the underlying space is different. And uh, <clears throat> in order to do this sum, so one can look at um, two um, um, uh, two forms, two bilinear of quadratic forms associated with this, either the topological or the um, kinetic. And uh, Q1 is interestingly non-commutative as it vanishes in the commutative case. Q2 here vanishes in the commutative cell dual case, uh, as in the um, five brain theory, but it's um, um, non-identically vanishing in the non-commutative setting, even if you impose self-duality. So this is really the main point here, is that you can allow these quadratic forms. And um, if you um, 
look at the signature of Q1 is given by the Bailey numbers. And again, the, the Bailey numbers are not changed because we're doing isospectral deformations. And um, the upshot of all of this is that if you calculate things properly, then um, the, the sum looks like this. And uh, with tau being the usual parameter, which is a modular form with holomorphic anti-holomorphic weights given by the cell dual anti-cell dual um, harmonic, theta harmonic three forms. So in this sense, you get, a, you get a partition function, which is a modular form already in 6D. But of course, there are a lot of things one has to explain. Where do these parameters come from, right? And does it correspond to the actual physical theory? But my hope is that one can, um, one can use this in order to describe the actual physical um, membrane, um, fibrane theory, because um, this solves, solves two problems, right? The cell duality and the modularity already in 6D. Um, you know, yes, Jay. Um, looking at the holomorphic Yes. Yes. Yeah, so, so the point is that everything that we're doing is called isospectral deformation. That, that is the spectral, the operators are preserved, which means that the cohomology is unchanged and any cohomological um, information is untouched. So, the determinant, yeah, again, the determinant is going to involve operators that are isospectrally deformed, so it works out for them as well. I mean, we did take care of all of that. I mean, in a previous version, it wrote down the partition function with all the determinant. I thought that was a Um, I, haven't, I haven't done much to the kinetic part. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, maybe we can discuss it in detail. But um, yeah, I mean, th this is a model. And of course, you can ask the question, why did you choose isospectral um, deformation as a quantization? Why not some other? This is very transparent. And it was um, the right thing to, to use here if you have a, a torus action. You could have used some other non-commutative um, deformation, but it won't be this transparent. It would, it would be much more complicated. And maybe that's something to do. Okay. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I'm agreeing. And I'm saying the reason that we believe it is consistent and we checked it is because it's... Yeah, right. Okay, thank you. Okay, and one can uh, look at modular weights using topological invariants. And one thing here to highlight is that, well, um, of course, in this theory, one can go through what Vafa and Witten did. Of course, we didn't go anywhere close to that, but one can maybe do that ultimately. But one thing that shows up is the signature. And um, what non-commuted deformations gives us is that one can define a signature operator in dimensions that are not um, multiples of 4K unlike the classical case. So this is a, a nice mathematical um, corollary that, that comes out that um, one can develop it from a math point of view, but uh, also might have implications here. Well, actually it did in the case of non-fibrate. Okay, um, so that was, that was the world volume perspective. I wanna talk a little bit about the um, space-time perspective. So here I wanna start with bosonic 11 dimensional supergravity, as usual, you look at the equations of motion, Bianchi identity, and these are the combinations that showed up earlier. That's why I had um, several terms associated with the five brain by looking at this Hodge dual here. And um, one can also look at the fermions. And of course, we're trying to extract geometry and topology here. One can look at the gauge transformations, that is the gauge algebra corresponding to the system by looking at the uh, variations of these, and uh, <clears throat> this is what the algebra turns out to be. Um, it's um, it's 
non-commutative. Uh, it's not abelian because of this Chern-Simons coupling that arose from um, whose source is that Chern-Simons term. Um, and um, yeah, this has been described um, from other points of view. So <clears throat> one can um, look at this by introducing generators uh, corresponding to the uh, gauge transformations. And uh, this is how the algebra looks like using graded commutators. And um, <clears throat> one can um, describe the dynamics by using motor cartan flatness forming a, a field strength like this using this Cosset representative and writing down the motor cartan equation, um, then it gives you the full dynamics that we wrote down before. Now, I want to give this more um, homotopic description. I mean, this is fine, but we want to see what kind of underlying homotopy theory there is to this. And um, this now connects to the discussion that I had before about looking at twisted DRAM cohomology, for example. So we, we, we said back then that you can twist by any odd degree, but what about even degree? Can you twist DRAM complex by an even degree? Well, of course, you can't naively, but you can modify it a little bit. If you look at the differential, you adjoin to it one of these generators that we talked about here um, so that the, the differential is total uniform degree one, then you can do it. So I observed this a while back and <clears throat> provided that G is closed, which is the case, for example, when I equals uh, two in, in M theory, and this is and the generator that we adjoin is Grassmann algebra valued, which is the case here. Um, so one can also form um, um, twists by more than one field. So you can say, well, I want to do duality symmetric twists. I want to twist by the C field and its dual at the same time. Can you do that? Yes, you can. So I form this combination, and the differential turns out to square to zero, is nilpotent, uh, provided that you have this relation, and dg7 equals half g4, g4. And this is exactly, the first is exactly the M-theory gauge algebra, and the second is the equation of motion for the, for the G field. So this tells you that the dynamics of M-theory does define um, a defined twisted DRAM complex at the rational level. Um, so one can uh, actually look at the M-theory action and um, discover a lot of homotopic um, in other ingredients as well. So one can write the, the action function using Massey products. So what, what signals this is that you have this equation of motion here. I want to read it from the right to the left. I want to read it as saying, that we're tri trivializing a cop product. So I have G4 cop G4, it is zero in cohomology. It means that the level of differential forms is D of something. And that thing is star G4. So I'm reading it the opposite way as you usually read it. So once you have that, then you're trivializing a primary, remember this discussion about primary and secondary operations. So aside from standard squares and torsion operations like that, like that there's a, a more fundamental kind of a primary operation, which is the Ka product. And once it vanishes, we have a secondary cohomology operation defined on the kernel of that, on the kernel of the Ka product. And that is secondary operation is the Massey product. I did mention that earlier. And um, you work this out and uh, uh, <clears throat> you, you realize, I did this with Igor Krij 15 years ago, that the equations of motion define a triple Massey product in a coset of H11. And um, <clears throat> so we can write the Lagrangian itself as a Massey product. And the one loop term is part of the indeter indeterminacy of this. And uh, recently with Dan Grady, we provided differential refinement of these Massey products to differential cohomology so that we can describe this action when everything has hats on them at the level of differential cohomology. So now, uh, in the remaining time, I just want to say a few more things about rational um, homotopy theory. Um, so I want to extract further rational homotopy theory ingredients. So the massive product is one of them. I want to say, well, OK, is that an accident? Or is there, is there really a rational homotopy structure in M theory? 
So we'll take another look at the equation of motion and the Bianchi identity. And then again, we keep asking the same questions over and over again. Uh, the rational level, that's what we're concentrating on. Previously, we talked about these more refined structures. So a priori, so where does G4 and star G4 live? So I already gave very highbrow answers earlier. Now I want to bring it down to earth a little bit. So I want to say, well, G4 should be described by a map to KZ4, because a priori it's some sort of a uh, cohomology class. And then its differential refinement should correspond to, um, to map to the uh, differential refinement of that allenberg maclean space with a connection. And the point here um, is that the product structure in allenberg maclean spaces is the comp product. And a priori, it has no information about that trivialization given what we interpreted here, here about the trivialization. We want, we want whatever describes this to know about it, to know about this trivialization. So, so Allenberg maclean spaces do not. So, um, so we need uh, G4 and G7 satisfying the equations to correspond um, to map somewhere. And in addition, we want to, upon differential refinement, to, to, to have this correspond to maps to a differential refinement to whatever answer we're trying to get in the topological case. So the question here was the question mark. Here's what the question mark is. So if one looks at the Silva model in rational, in rational homotopy theory, there are two ways of looking at um, rational homotopy groups, either using Sullivan um, minimal models or using uh, Quillen models. One is more associated with um, cohomology, the other is more associated with homology. So, um, so this, the basic idea here is that you want to try to describe spaces using algebras, using algebras associated with their rational homotopy groups. That's the idea, because if you do that, it becomes very transparent or at least systematic. If you have an algebraic machinery, you can run it. Um, so, <clears throat> so one notices that the equations of motion correspond to the um, commuted differential graded algebra model of the four sphere. So if you look at that model for the four sphere, it's a um, exterior al algebra on two generators with the indicated degrees, such that dy7 is y4 squared, dy4 is zero. And then you notice, well, okay, these are the equations of motion and Bianchi identity. Uh, what about the factor of half? So there's a factor of half in the, I don't know if I should keep going back to that, sorry. A half here, or a minus, or so on. So the factor of half can be explained by the fact that there's an operation called the Whitehead product, uh, or the Whitehead bra bracket, and we are in the dimension of a um, half vibration, namely the quaternionic half vibration, which plays a fundamental role here. And um, in that, this uh, bracket is divisible by two, so the generator is divided by two. And um, if we look at the dual model, which is the Quillen model, um, then um, one works out the Quillen model in a, in a manner similar to what I did previously using other notations when we set up the uh, differential corresponding to G4 and what we get is that the Lie bracket dual to the differential is given by this. When n equals 2, then this gives us the bracket um, xi minus 3, xi minus 3 is 2, xi minus 6, which is exactly that um, equation that we had earlier with v minus 3, v minus 3 is v minus 6 in different notation. So, so what we get here is that the Silva model knows about the dynamics. The Quillen model knows about the gauge algebra. So it's very indicative that there's something going on here. And um, so recently, so the last several years with Urs Schreiber and Domenico Fioranza, we've been uh, trying to push this uh, further. We have um, several works on this. And Urs is going to pick up uh, the latest and when he gives his talk this afternoon. Um, so the proposal then becomes that higher gauge fields in M-theory cycles in cohomotopy. So remember, homotopy means 
you look at homotopy classes of maps from spheres to a space, the homotopy is going to be sort of like the opposite. You can look at homotopy classes of maps from a space to a sphere. So S4 is sort of going to be the answer to what we have here. So what describes the dynamics of G4, G7 is going to be S4, maps from Y to S4, instead of maps from Y to Z4. So we're finding a replacement of the classifying space, which only knows about cohomology, but now this is nonlinear. Because it's nonlinear, it has more information than linear things. So it's sort of like nonlinear cohomology, if you like, in the homotopy setting. Sorry, Martin. Yeah. What happened to the condition that there's certain form instead Yeah, so I mentioned earlier in passing that um, I'm taking this democratic point of view that the two are independent. So there's this duality symmetric formulation where you can say. It's an important no, it is, but uh, yeah, but I mean, people sometimes do that. They say, I have that constraint, but now. I'm going to treat them as independent variables. But you don't, your, your equations don't imply that constraint, so you're not getting the full field equation. You're not getting the correct dynamic. Yeah, I'm getting G7. Yeah, there's a further condition that G7 equals star G4. But I mean, um, Why can you just drop that? I'm not dropping it, but I'm saying it, it, doesn't, it doesn't contradict anything that I'm doing. It doesn't spit it out, but it doesn't contradict it. So we need further refinements of this. Is that okay? It, it doesn't predict it. You're right. But it doesn't contradict it. Yeah. Okay. Very good. So which means that further refinements are needed. Yeah? All right. Um, excellent point. Um, um, so, uh, yeah. So the, the proposal is that uh, the dynamics in... Um, the dynamics in M theory is described as co-cycles and cohomotopy. And um, we start with looking at the rational setting. And in order for this proposal to make sense, you want it to um, reduce to things that we know, for example. So we know that in um, string theory, in type 2A string theory, for example, the fields are described by twisted K theory, right? So Peter and Matai and others have established this and Jack, right? Um, so, so the question is, if you have this S4, what does it have to do with twisted K theory? It looks very far from twisted K theory. But the upshot, well, the main point is going to be, uh, I don't have time to go through all of that. I'm almost out of time. But the point is going to be that not only is it consistent, in fact, we derive, we derive twisted K theory from cohomotopy, we derive, not from a mathematical homotopic point of view. We derive twisted K theory from degree four cohomotopy using parameterized homotopy theory. Um, so, okay, the first point here, I'm gonna almost out of time, just flush a few things, that even this cohomotopy, by the fact that it has co here, it's a cohomology theory, and then for any cohomology theory, you can provide differential refinement, so we can look at differential cohomotopy, and then the answer to the question, where do the differential um, fields live? They live in differential cohomotopy. So that answers the two questions that we raised. And then, um, so let's see, where should I go from here? I'm almost uh, done. So I can look at the reduction reduction of the S4, so if the fields in M theory are modeled by S4, what would the fields in type 2A string theory be modeled by? And um, if we start with the model for the four sphere, then it, it's going to be by adjunctions, and because um, M theory and type 2A string theory are related by a circle bundle, there's going to be an adjunction in such a way that you get the the loop group of whatever group you started with in M theory as a structure group down in in type 2A, so you're going to get the loop space of S4 because S4 is our um, model. And then indeed, if you look at the chevalier allenberg algebra of the, um, of the loop space of S4, then it gives you, and then you mod out by the circle action, as you do in general for loop spaces, then you get this. And what is this? This is exactly the dynamics 
of the Ramon Ramon fields together with the Neveshwar's fields. Look at this. So df2 is 0, df4 is h3f2, df6 is h3f4, dh3 is 0, dh7 is that. It's exactly the same even with the, with the constants. So this at the rational level though, so we can derive from the rational force sphere rational twisted K-theory, which is a fancy name of saying rational cohomology. But then because this, the constructions are functorial, then one wants to say, well, if we go beyond the rational level, then this holds as well. And indeed, recently, and Urs is going to have the chance to say a lot more about this than I can, I'm almost done, um, is that it works, it's starting to work non-rationally as well. So it's very indicative. And um, um, so, so this is what we have. We have a derivation twisted K theory from M theory using parametrized spectra and parametrized homotopy theory. And this, this answers the question that I had in mind for a long time, which cohomology theory describes the fields in M theory. And this is, this is one very um, plausible proposal because it, it corresponds to um, things that we know. I think I'm out of time, right? Five more minutes? Okay, I was rushing to, to give this punchline here. Um, um, okay, um, so basically here, what we do is, is derive twisted K theory from, from the force field, as I mentioned earlier, as opposed to a, just a consistency check. And again, Urs is going to uh, talk about this in, in detail later, I think. He's not here now, but he's around. Um, so one, one, thing, one other thing I want to mention briefly is higher duality in M theory. So we know from the works of Peter and Matai um, that T duality, well, on the, on the topological side, that T duality is, is a very important feature of, of string theory and they've um, established that field. What we noticed recently with uh, Domenico Firenza and Urs Schreiber is that we can, we can discover a T duality in M theory itself, uh, which is which relates to another T duality for sphere bundles that Peter, Matai, and, um, and Jara, Evslin have talked about as well. Um, and it has features of both. So let me explain this briefly. Um, so th this is also um, c comes as a derivation by looking at super torsion constraints and super cycles. That's the part that I skipped. Um, and um, so it, it has the it describes higher version of, of T-duality in string theory. And um, what does this word higher mean? So the higher means um, gerbs. So we look at gerbs at the rational level. So there's a, a T-duality between rational gerbs and other rational gerbs, um, as opposed to tori. Usually in T-duality, your internal space is, is a torus, and you have a duality between a torus and another torus bundle, let's say, um, and for spheres. So here it works for um, gerbs. So, um, and what involves, it brings in also exceptional generalized geometry. I think we have, we're going to hear talks about this, David, maybe. Um, so it, it, it has a, a new kind of topology change where if you look at a three sphere, so you can f first set up the T duality for spheres, as Matai and Peter did, and then um, you, you can have on the one side a three sphere, on the other side you can have a, a torus of a much bigger dimension and then you can trade off um, small dimension and non-abelian nature with very large torus but abelian. So this takes non-abelian t-duality, um, again in, in Peter and Matai's sense to abelian t-duality. Okay, and this actually uh, we derive this, I emphasize, we derive it using the super torsion constraints, and it's, it doesn't involve any extrapolation from preserver string theory or any analogies. This is really a derivation, even using physics standards, okay? Um, so, um, okay, I already mentioned this, um, using the constraints, using the super torsion constraints, working it out. Um, so this is the idea here. So rationally, um, here's really the main point. So rationally, higher bundles of odd degree are equivalent to higher spheres of odd dimension. 
So we mentioned the even sphere S4. Rationally, S4, unfortunately, well, fortunately in that case, it's not really an eilenberg maclean space. It's a product of two of them. But for the odd spheres, they are just one eilenberg maclean space. So if you, have, um, if you have internal space, which is an odd sphere, and you're looking at things rationally, um, you can replace it by an odd rational eilenberg maclean space. What does that imply? It implies you're replacing something highly non-abelian with something abelian. That's what this buys you. And so a two-gerb, of course, we're going to view um, whenever we talk about higher, higher eilenberg maclean spaces, then we view them as higher gerbs. In this case, in for n equals 1, it's a gerb, and it's equivalent to an S3 principal bundle. So you can take the the sphere context and change it into a gerb context if you are in the rational setting. Um, and this requires that these things live in extended space times. And Jack and uh, um, Eric, right? You guys talk about um, what do you call it? Extended sigma models. Yeah, it's in, in that spirit. So. Um, one can set up a lot of analogies. I mean, the, the derivation is not an analogy, but after the fact, one looks at analogy. The motor cartan form is replaced by C3. The curvature is a curvature of a three bundle. T dualizable flux, this combination becomes that combination which naturally shows up from the Chern Simons form in M theory. Integration over the fiber, over the circle fiber, integration over, well, well this. Of course, the, this is set up by Matai and, and Peter in general, but in our setting, this is what we have. And one can form Poincare form. Um, similarly, um, in flux transformations, in isomorphisms of twisted, um, uh, twisted theories as well, twisted cohomology theories, because as Matai and Peter explained to us over the last, what, 10 years, T duality is an isomorphism between twisted uh, cohomology theories. Um, and uh, so one can interpret these, these uh, terms that show up here using um, as, as a new effect in M theory. Um, and, and these should couple. You see, the analogy here is that the, M, <coughs> the M5 brain is the analog of the string, not the M2 brain is the analog of the string. The M5 brain is the analog of the string. And of course, the string ends on D brains, and you can talk about T duality for D brains. Now, the, the point here becomes the M5 brain is going to end on something. What is that thing? Right? And then there are ideas that there's this thing called M9 brain. Right? We have senior string theorists here. They can tell me. Right? M9 brain. Um, okay, so that's one uh, proposal here is that this describes <clears throat> that brain that one can. Um, uh, that one can interpret explicitly if you reduce the heterotic boundary, then one can make that very precise. Um, and then um, this is the new topology change mechanism that I was talking about. Um, you have this super two gerb over super space time, something we called M2 brain. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a one degree analog, but one degree higher of, of the string group. It's a string group, but in one categorical degree higher, but rational. And then you map exceptional generalized supergeometry to it through this comparison map. And um, the idea here is that <clears throat> once, once you do that, and you look at a, you try to compare C fields here with C fields there, and it turns out that under this comparison map, one works it out explicitly. Um, so what happens is this becomes um, decomposable as a form, and it actually becomes um, abelian. So that's the point here. Um, and uh, for this, one can use um, C cohomology, which is the kernel modular image of copying with this uh, C form. And... Um, <clears throat> 
so the point here is that we get 517 torus. We replace the original irrational T-sphere with a 517 torus um, identified as the tangent space of this uh, part of the exceptional geometry that we have here. This is the relation between the two. And, <clears throat> and as an application of this is we can um, describe parity symmetry in M theory using this formulation. So we have T duality in M theory. What sort of transformations do we have in M theory? We have this parity symmetry. So C3 goes to minus C3 and um, one can uh, set it up. So let me explain it in, in the case of uh, E8 uh, bundles. So um, if we look at an E8 bundle, another E8 bundle, I want to look at T duality between two E8 bundles. And the point here is that E8 and SU2 and hence S3 have the same, and hence KQ3 have the same rational homotopy type up to the 14 skeleton, up to if you're on spaces of dimension 14 or less, then you don't see all of E8. Oops, you only see that part. And so you can set up the problem so that you have the two A bundles, one with a class A and one with a class minus A, such a way that there's transformation between the two. You can set that up as S3 bundles or as gerbs, right? Any one of these formulations is, is okay. And once you have spheres, then you add T duality for spheres and interpret this as a T duality in M theory. So T duality in M theory um, can explain the parity symmetry in M theory. That's the application that we have. And I'm done, thank you so much. You do it, yeah. Um, so, um, yeah, so the next step is to try to do U duality. So we don't know, that's a question on our mind, actually. Does one contain the other? Or I, I noticed that you, you avoid total bounds for the supplying brains. <laughs> yes. Um, so, I mean, I, I, don't know, I don't know the answer, but it, it's something on my mind. I mean, we haven't checked. It's a good question, and we haven't actually. Neil Lambert asked me the same question in Durham, and since then, nothing happened. It's on, still on the back of our minds, so we haven't thought about it. But it's an excellent question. So the next step, yeah, what, what, what about U duality? It's an excellent point, but we haven't had the chance to uh, look at that explicitly. I think that's the point of the meeting. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, uh, so on, on T6, T6. Am, I, uh, am I allowed to just take the core development blocks from the concentration information? Um, I mean, guess I'm asking because I thought that in that case, if you have a quadratic action, yeah. like, um, the, the information that uh, if you put those derivative terms that go away. Yeah, I forgot why they got the non commutative uh, term. Yes. Oh, oh, oh! Sorry, I have a microphone. Yeah. So uh, the question, the question was that there's um, Con Douglas um, Schwarz uh, theory on T6 on a torus on a on a flat space, and does the non-commutativity parameter here correspond to that? Um, yeah, I'm not sure. I haven't checked. Um, it's analogous. Uh, they also have a non commutative torus right. to uh, get generalized solutions to some of the previous equations. Yes. So this is uh, a deformation of the space. So the space, six dimensional space, is not really a space. It's a non commutative space. Yeah, so suppose in that case, if I have a quadratic action, the deformation is, it, it, it gives a total derivative term, but it only shows up in cubic. And 
higher, I mean, the non trivial deformation I thought is only cubic and higher. We don't have a perturbation like that. Yeah. We, yeah, we introduced it by hand. Uh, we didn't say where it comes from. I know David and collaborators, they brought it from the sea field. Sorry, go ahead. It's not arbitrary, except that we did not really, we did not really pin down what condition it, it needs. But that's a valid point. Yeah, we need to pin that down. But we did not. That's a good point. Yes, I mean we did it locally and then globally. We extended it as a global gerb as well. Any other questions? Theta deformation theta or theta angle? Theta deformation. So you have a deformation parameter theta. Yeah. So for example, for deep brains, this parameter is related to the inverse of a magnetic Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. And then you can take a limit to which theta goes to zero. Yeah. And then what you get is the ordinary um, theory that is not deformed. So you could say you have non commutative um, gauge theory. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, that's a good point. We did not take that limit. Yeah, that's a good point. So if you take this theta goes to zero limit, what do you get? No, we didn't. We didn't check. No. I mean, naively you get zero, but you don't want to get zero. You you want to. <laughs> so we did. We did not. We did not work around the problems so that you don't get zero. So that's a good point. Yeah. Any more questions? Okay, now let's thank the speaker again. Thank you.